Hello everybody, I am Jert Ross, a genie vlogger, and on today's Professional Genealogist Reacts, I'll be reacting to Are Iranians European? A Historical and Genetic Analysis of Iran by Ancestral Brew. Now this is a channel I just found, it popped up in my recommends, and when I saw this video as a suggested, I immediately put it in my watch later, because I thought this would be a great video to watch just based on the title, because... Are Iranians European a historical and genetic analysis I've ran makes it sound like he is going to go in depth to the uh, information about what makes up the populations of Iran. So the population group history and a lot of what he may end up talking about may be a lot of things that can explain why, you know, if you're Iranian, I haven't seen a whole lot of Iranian um, DNA results. I should start off by saying now we did have the one video I watched by Bahadur Alast, which was the Persian results, which I ended up actually watching a lot of his videos because there are a lot of really cool language videos. But anyway, um, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot, but you know, what he talks about may explain why you're getting certain results because when it comes to um the dna admixtures that you get from autosomal dna you know ancestry dna family tree dna 23andme my heritage living dna so on and so forth when you get those admixtures you are seeing what you know your your population ancestry is for the most part at least where your genes are coming from so it's not your full ancestral picture but when you get it people will notice it changes over time. And part of why it changes over time is because things aren't so cut and dry and population groups are related to each other. They share ancestors and things can make that complicated in terms of reading the DNA and trying to pinpoint, especially in a modern sense, where that's coming from. So I'm hoping that this video will kind of explain a lot of that kind of stuff. So now, before we do jump into the video, please be sure to give this a thumbs up. It really helps me out. And be sure to subscribe and click that bell for notifications on future videos. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead. We'll jump right into the video. With recent events taking place in the Middle East, I thought it might be an appropriate time to provide some historical context into one of the key regions of that area, Iran. For those that don't know, my background is Iranian and ever since I was a child I've had an immense fascination about the culture and history of the region. To me, the place represents a pinnacle of cultural exchange with both the East and the West and subsequently having some knowledge about the region to provide context to not only Iran itself but the history of the world. One of the key things that I hear from a lot of Iranians as well as those engaged in the anthropological community um, is surrounding the identity of Iranians. Many people foresee Iranians as being similar to their neighbors uh, such as the Arabs and the Turks. Um, as a matter of fact, Iranians are quite distinct um, being part of the broader Indo-European language family. Now this brings me to the main focal point of the video. Are Iranians European and where does their national identity come from? Iranians take great pride in distinguishing themselves from their neighbours, referring to their long, far-stretching history. To answer the question of whether Iranians are European and where exactly their national identity comes from, we must first look at the original people of the Iranian plateau. The history of the greater Iranian plateau ranges far back into the millennia. The region had been a historical site for Neanderthals and was a key region where Homo sapiens and Neanderthals intermixed. But for us to really gain an understanding of the Iranian culture, we won't go as far back to the Paleolithic. Instead, we will focus on the Neolithic, around the time where the uh, agricultural revolution was taking place. For the historians out there, we all know that agriculture was formed in the Fertile Crescent, somewhere in the Levant, by a culture known as the Natufians. The Natufians were really the uh, catalyst for farming spreading into Europe, and they formed the basis of the early European farmers who spread into that region. However, unknown to most historians, were a separate group of farmers. These farmers 
lived in the Zagros mountain ranges of Iran and they are responsible for uh, transmuting the farming from the Fertile Crescent into more eastward nations such as India. For Based on what he's talking about so far, I'm really hoping what he's going to get into is how they've been able to prove a lot of um, population migration and connection using Y DNA, um, using Y chromosome. Now, this is something I actually just listened to a talk today uh, from Adam Brown, who runs the Avitenu uh, Y DNA project and the Avitenu uh, genetic genetic census of the Jewish people, where they are looking at autosomal DNA, Y DNA, and mitochondrial DNA to look at the history of the, of the Jewish people. And using Y DNA, you can actually tell really, really well about the history of those lineages. So hopefully he goes into some of that because he does say a genetic analysis. So I would imagine that's the case. Forming places like the Indus Valley Civilization. This group of people who discovered farming would settle in the marshy plains of southern Iran and Iraq, near the Tigris and the Euphrates. They formed a civilization that would rival that of the Assyrians, with constant conflict and contact between Mesopotamian cultures as well as this culture inside southern Iran. Now, one thing I do want to say, just as a quick aside, I guess technically it's directed right at... Um... Uh, ancestral brew i don't know his his real name but um one thing that i notice as a youtuber is when i see the images online i want to be able to kind of study them so it's really difficult that he's got the images kind of popping up and then popping away this culture was known as elam known by the biblical texts as the elamites the elamites were a unique group of people their language is isolated and diverse from those of their surrounding regions. Historians sometimes even classify the Elamite language as being Dravidian, similar to the language groups spoken in southern Iran. Could it be that these initial people who discovered farming in what was that southern, little pop-up that could just... it be that these similar to the language groups spoken in southern Iran? Southern India, not southern Iran. I've made mistakes like that too. So okay, yeah. That's interesting. One of the things that I've always found that's kind of interesting is the correlation between language and then migrations of people. Um, I mean, if you look at the history of language, which if you guys uh, already don't know, the channel Useful Charts, who I've collaborated with, um, he's, he has videos about that. And if you haven't seen it, check it out because it's really cool um, because it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a family tree unto itself. And it you know, a lot of times I think it does follow population routes. Could it be that these initial people who discovered farming in southern Iran actually have genetic ties with those in southern India? We refer to haplogroups and really delve High into DNA. the paternal haplogroup of the Iranian male. Now, it must be known that Iran is an incredibly diverse place with a relatively... Okay, yeah, this is this is a whole lot going on here. I'm gonna try to try to kind of read through it. So it's really it's it's kind of like a heat map, the different ethnic groups within Iran. Which you know I've always I've always heard that Iran is a place that is you know quite a mixed uh, mixed area in terms of the different groups. And so it's a lot that's kind of a little bit above my head. I mean, I know, you know, I know about the Kurds or I, I've heard of the Kurds would be a better way to put it. Um, and then, okay. Religions of Iran, uh, Muslims, Shia, Christian. Yeah, this is kind of an, this is kind of an interesting map. This is pretty cool. So let's see what else he has to say about the, uh, haplogroups. ...diverse genetic profile. However, if we consider the DNA profile of the average Iranian, we can see that the dominant paternal... JM172. That's what I am, JM172, which if you haven't seen my video on the whole genome sequencing nebula test, I go into depth about my Y haplo group and uh, putting it up on Y full. So I am J1, JM172. As a matter of fact, my own haplo group belongs to this So, 
So, so we ancestral brew and I share a distant, distant ancestor who probably lived sometime around the time that he's talking about. Which is a very West Asian haplogroup. If we look at the spread of haplogroup J2, we can see that it is primarily centralized in the Caucasus. It also spreads as far west as southern Europe and as far yeah. east as India. Because this is the dominant haplogroup in Iran, some have hypothesized that haplogroup J2 would have been the haplogroup of the Elamites. This can be hmm. seen in the sense that uh, certain communities in uh, South Asia, such as India and Pakistan, also represent a large frequency of haplogroup J2. For this reason alone, it can be clearly uh, exemplified that the Iranian genome is unique to its region. And subsequently claims that Iranians are European and have genetic ties to Germanic and other Indo-European cultures is a bit of an exaggeration. However, it is not all that incorrect. From the Elamites, we must now travel further in time, a time closer to the Iron Age, around 3000 BC. It is here in 3000 BC that a cataclysmic event takes place in human history. The Iron Age is classified as a time of conquests and clashing of different cultures. And this in itself can be attributed to the domestication of the horse, which enabled hmm. peoples such as the Proto-Indo-Europeans to spread far and spread their culture and their genetics. Around 3000 years ago, a group of these Proto-Indo-Europeans, a people who originated in the Pontic Caspian steppe and are responsible for forming all the world's European languages started to migrate southwards from Turkmenistan into Iran. These people were the Aryans, the Arya, and they have veneration in texts such as the Sanskrit Vedic texts, as well as the Avestas, which formed the basis of the Zoroastrian religion. The etymology <laughs> of the word Iran itself comes from the word Iran Shah, which means land of the Aryans. As a result of their sophisticated use of chariots, horses, and Iron Age technology, the Aryans were able to dominate their landscape and soon took over from their Elamite counterparts. It is around 700 BC where these Iron Age people form a formidable empire, one which had not been seen in its time since the time of the Sumerians and the Neo-Assyrian Empire. These people were known as the Medes, and they are the descendants of the modern day Kurds. This northwestern Iranian people group dominated Anatolia as well as Iran and formed formidable kingdoms. This Median Empire was able to unite the numerous Iranian tribes that lived within the greater Iranian region and rose to power. However, in 553 BC, the grandson of a renowned Median king rebels. This man is known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great is one of the most renowned figures in Persian history and is venerated for his ability to unite all of Iran and actually formulate the basis of the Persian Empire. Under the reign of Cyrus, Persia's expanse stretches as far west and neighbours the Greeks and as far east, neighbouring the Hindustan region. Before we get immersed into the far-stretching history of the Persian Empire, let's just reflect back on the genetic studies conducted by historians to really get a feel of who these Persians were. The Proto-Indo-Europeans split off into two branches, forming the Aryans and in the West forming cultures like the Corded Ware culture. Within the Aryans, there was migrations southwards into the Caucasus, as well as migration southeast into Turkmenistan. It is actually here in Turkmenistan where the basis of the Iranian people takes place. In Turkmenistan, prior to the migration of the Indo-Europeans were a people known as the BMAC people. The Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex, or the BMAC people, also known as the Oxus culture, were a people separate from the Indo-Europeans who resided inside modern-day Turkmenistan. When we reflect back on historical recreations of these people, we are able to observe that these people represent 
typically West Asian phenotypes as well as traits. Subsequently, it can be postulated that the ancestors of Cyrus the Great, the Persians, the Great Persians, were a mixture or a hybridization of the BMAC people as well as the Indo-European cultures, predominantly the Andronova culture, uh, mixing together. And if we look at genetic studies of these ancient Iranians, we can see that they typically represented the DNA profile of the modern Iranian with the slight shifting towards a more European uh, cluster. Pretty much what I'm articulating here is that ancient Iranians display a very, very similar DNA profile to the DNA of modern Iranians with the slight exception that their DNA is a bit more European shifted and contains less Turkic influences. So, are Iranians Europeans? No, not exactly, but they do have European roots. Inside our language and culture are remnants of uh, Indo-European influences. For example, our words for mum, dad, brother, sister are all mm. of Indo-European origin. Modav means mother. Darodav means brother. Kedar means father. As you guys can witness, the Iranian national identity from a historical standpoint is extremely complex. For yeah. me to run through all of the historical context behind this people group would take a several part video series in itself. I hope that this video is of interest and intrigue to you and compels you to want to expand your own knowledge about the history of places unknown to the West. By understanding history, we will gain a better context about not only our neighbors, but also ourselves. So I thank you dearly and stay tuned for more. All right, that was, uh, that was a pretty good video. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, when it comes to deep ancestral history, I'm really not the best. Most of my expertise, especially in terms of genealogy and study of history, is mostly within the past 400, 500 years, uh, maybe sometimes a little bit back, 600, 700. So a lot of the stuff that he's covering is very like, you know, for me, it's just general kind of, you know, I had a general idea of it. Um, so it's interesting to see him go in depth. Um, I spoke about it in earlier in the video, although it might be something that's only special on Patreon. Uh, but I saw a talk today about, um, why DNA in the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish people. And basically a lot of it seems to be talking about similar stuff. Although the talk talked more a bit about the bronze age and how that affected things than necessarily the iron age. Um, but, you know, it really is true that it, when it comes to world history, we're all really connected. And especially if you're thinking about, you know, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, every single person three to 4,000 years ago had trillions, if not more, of ancestors, which it obviously was not possible to have trillions of ancestors and by by that i mean you know you have two parents four grandparents eight great grandparents 16 second great grandparents and so on so it keeps doubling so when you get back that many generations three thousand years you're looking at trillions so what it really means is that basically everybody three thousand years ago if they have any living descendants it's very likely that you may be one of them um so you know one of the things that was said in the talk that i watched today was that for every single person in the world, if you go three, you know, 3000 years back in time, your ancestors were very likely not living where you're living now. Um, I mean, it's probably not the case for everybody necessarily, but, um, yeah, it's, it, it is very interesting seeing this stuff. Now, this is what he talked about. Doesn't necessarily apply to those who or I shouldn't say it doesn't apply, but like when you're looking at your ethnicity admixture through an autosomal DNA test, what he's talking about, you probably won't see. Um, it may explain why certain things may have difficulty in being seen because when you have connections between two population groups where they have this ancestral connection, it's harder to tell them apart genetically. So when you have these different distant ancestries for different population groups, but they share those different ancestries, 
um, or their, I guess it wouldn't necessarily be different ancestry, it'd be the same ancestry, then that can cause that difficulty. Now he has some other videos on his channel that are along the same lines. He has a video called The Origins of the Turkic People. Um, so, you know, I'm guessing that his specialty, his expertise is in um, much more older ancestries. So kind of like what anthropologists will be looking at or... Um, you know, deep ancestral histories, you know, thousands of years ago, not hundreds of years ago. Uh, so, so hopefully he'll, maybe he'll have some other stuff um, where he gets further into genetics as well. Well, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me out. You can also click right about here if you'd like to subscribe. It's completely free to do so. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger, see you in my next video.